Jack Balkin is the Knight Professor of Constitutional Law and the First Amendment at Yale Law School. I frankly admit that I am one of the two greatest of buyers of Jack's work, the other being Sandy Levinson. What about Mrs. <laughs> In Sa right. In Sandy's estimation, Jack is the Picasso of constitutional theory. As I put it yesterday, in having Cass Sunstein and Jack Balkin as our Friday and Saturday keynote speakers, we have the two greatest constitutional theorists of my generation, the generation of scholars born around the time of Brown versus Board of Education. Jack is the author of many books, most notably Living Originalism and Constitutional Redemption, Political Faith in an Unjust World. We had a wonderful symposium on Jack's living originalism together with David Strauss's The Living Constitution here a couple of years ago and published it in BU Law Review. And so we're delighted to have Jack back for this event as well. Jack is also the editor of What Brown versus Board of Education Should Have Said and What Roe versus Wade Should Have Said. Based on the discussion yesterday and today, Jack, I suggest you continue the series with perhaps what Heller should have said, or what National Federation of Independent Business should have said. Now, I've asked Jack to be the Saturday luncheon speaker near the end of the conference to respond to the main arguments that we've heard about America's political dysfunction. Now, why is Jack the perfect person for this role? Well, talk about dysfunction, breakdown, and failure is pretty depressing business, right? And so toward the end of a conference on this topic, we need someone who can bring not only insight, but also humor to our understanding of our present predicament. Also, I wanted someone who might be able to suggest that we should have faith in the project of redemption of the Constitution's promises through a workable scheme of constitutional self-government. Jack? I have many different electronic devices to turn on before we can get started, so we will do one at a, we'll do them one at a time. All right, when, when you're recording me appropriately, signal. All right, that's a good signal, I like that. Um, this is, uh, it's very difficult to be asked by Jim Fleming to do something like this. He told me, I, don't, I, 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 want, I wanted you to talk because you're dysfunctional. <laughs> uh, you never prepare anything in advance, so I want you to listen to what everyone says, and I want you to summarize it all and respond to it. And above all, I want it to be entertaining because people are going to be eating, so they're going to get kind of tired and sleepy. Uh, and please don't tell any, uh, any war stories about what you did in the Obama administration. So I'm going to do the best I can. So I've got a lot on my plate here, and I'm going to try to have to explain to you what I think about all this, uh, trying to build on what other people have said. Um, so my, the title of my talk for today is The Last Days of Disco. Uh, the Last Days of Disco, how many of you even remember disco? All right, very good. When I, I, Kenmore Square used to be the, uh, the site of all the uh, disco uh, places where you'd go and dance. Uh, but in any case, The Last Days of Disco uh, is a Witz, uh, Stillman film, uh, which is about uh, basically, uh, it's like a coming of age film of young people uh, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s who don't really know what they're doing and, and you know, they, they're transitioning from a more difficult time and they finally get to the other side and it's kind of a comedy of manners and all that. But The Last Days of Disco also refers to the period of the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, when in fact the United States did go through a transition, a very difficult transition uh, on the other side. And at the beginning of the, the last days of disco, um, most people thought the United States was thoroughly ungovernable. Uh, and by the time uh, disco is over, um, nobody says that anymore. That is to say that uh, we, there was a previous regime of dysfunction. It was also the end of one constitutional regime and the beginning of another constitutional regime. And, and, and my message for you today is simply that. 
that what looks like constitutional dysfunction is actually constitutional transition. It's a point that Mark Graber made yesterday. Uh, that it's a, trans, uh, it's a movement between two constitutional regimes. Uh, this particular transition is going to be very difficult for reasons I will explain a little bit later, drawing on Steve Skoranek's work. Uh, but we, in fact, will get through it. Uh, and when we get through it on the other side, it will look quite different. And people will not, in fact, say that we are in a, a system of constitutional dysfunction anymore. Uh, however, I'm, it's not an entirely Pollyanna story because, in fact, because this particular transition is going to be long and hard and it doesn't have the benefits of some previous transitions, um, there will be a lot of scars left over by this particular transition. Uh, there will be a lot of kludges, uh, and so what we will get will not be anybody's idea of a perfect um, new constitutional order, but one that bears the traces of the past in the way that lots of transitions have. Well, that's the big idea. Um, now I'm going to go into some more detail, but first I want to talk a little bit about my dear friend Sandy Levinson's work, and then I want to talk about the idea of constitutional transition, and here I'm going to build on uh, Steve Skoranek's work and also Mark Graber's, and a little bit of Shep Melnick's too. So that's the idea, that's the, that's the, uh, that's the stew, and occasionally I'll make references to disco, uh, for, so those of you so you can stay awake. Uh, first, let me begin by talking about Sandy. Uh, first, I have to address the question that Sandy addresses, which is whether or not we have a truly dysfunctional constitution, and maybe the problem is the constitution and not anything else. My view is the same as Mark's. The problem is the constitutional order. It's not the constitution. Uh, Mark uh, mentioned yesterday that Sandy's uh, bar mitzvah speech in 1954 uh, did not presume a, con a dysfunctional constitution. That's actually correct, Mark. I, I actually have read Sandy's bar mitzvah speech from 1954. It's available on the internet. Uh, the title of his bar mitzvah speech was Our Dysfunctional Torah. <laughs> uh, how, how holy scripture uh, gets it wrong and how we the chosen people can make it better. That was the uh, original speech. Uh, did not go over very well with the rabbi but that's okay. Uh, anyway, Sandy's theory, uh, which is that our problems arise from a dysfunctional constitution, uh, depends on an, an important distinction, two different important distinctions, actually, which I think are not the same. One is the distinction between the constitution of conversation and the constitution of settlement. Um, and the constitution of conversation is what law professors care about, you know, cases, things like that, things that you could litigate. The constitution of settlement is things that you don't litigate, uh, right? Um, that are, they are therefore they're not in constitutional law case books. And the other distinction which Sandy makes, which isn't as well made, but which I will make here, is the distinction between the hardwired constitution and the, con the constitution that are not hardwired. I would call that the constitution of construction. That is not susceptible to constitutional construction. Hardwired means it's something that you cannot change without a constitutional amendment. And obviously, uh, construction is that which you can change without a constitutional amendment, either through judicial de uh, decision making or through statutes or changes in conventions or so forth. So now, the basic idea, uh, Sandy says, is that the reason why our constitutional is dysfunctional has nothing to do with the constitution of conversation. He says that's just a few more judicial appointments or statutes away. Uh, the real problem is the constitution uh, of settlement. Uh, but I actually disagree. Uh, I actually think that the Sandys, uh, there are two different distinctions. It's important to understand that when you, that the constitution of settlement, right, even if that's the cause, is not the same thing as the hardwired constitution. The hardwired constitution is a much smaller uh, segment than the constitution of settlement. So even if we say that the constitution of settlement is in fact a problem, well, that's just a question of changing those features of the Constitution of Settlement. Let me give you an example. Suppose you were going to list some of the things that make us dysfunctional. They would be, for example, our existing campaign finance system, uh, the, the way in which we organize uh, districts, our redistricting system, uh, whether we have proportional representation or first past the post. Um, what are the Senate rules for filibusters? Uh, what about the Hastert rule, which isn't even a rule? but is simply a custom that's been adopted by the current uh, Speaker of the House in order to keep his job. That is, the only reason the Hastert rule is invoked is because the current, uh, uh, the current Speaker of the House doesn't want to get thrown out. So it's actually basically one guy's rule. Um, 
And if you were to, in fact, uh, or take, for example, Citizens United, which I don't actually think is the central problem, but you can probably come up with other examples, or take, for example, uh, uh, Shelby County, which is about the, the Voting Rights Act. All of these things are either parts of the Constitution of Conversation, or they are part of the Constitution of Settlement that can be solved by, without using a constitutional amendment or a new constitutional convention. So in fact, the real, the major problems, we might say, of dysfunction today, if you think of them, they are, they require basically a change in the political regime, really more than they require a constitutional convention or uh, require a constitutional amendment. Not that I'm opposed to constitutional amendment, it's just that I don't think that's in fact the solution to the problem. But that of course leads us to the question of how you're going to have a change in political regime, and that of course brings us to the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is the elephant in the room, that is the GOP. Now, um, Ornstein and Mann have written this book, It's Even Worse Than It Seems, uh, in which they have this quote that's, uh, that, that's all being quoted all the time, um, in, in which they lay their cards on the table and they say, let's just say it, the Republicans are the problem. And they have a famous quote that's repeated over and over again in op-eds, which I will now read aloud for you, and I want to meditate on it for a while. Um, uh, this is their view. The GOP has become an insurgent outlier in American politics. It is ideologically extreme, scornful of compromise, unmoved by conventional understanding of facts, evidence, and science, and dismissive of the legitimacy of its political opposition. When one party moves this far from the mainstream, it makes it nearly impossible for the political system to deal constructively with the country's challenges. Well, tell us what you really think. Uh, put in terms of disco, uh, Ornstein and Mann are saying that the Republican anthem is the tramp's burn baby burn disco inferno. Or to paraphrase Yvonne Elliman from the Saturday Night Fever album, if I can't have power, I don't want no government baby. If I can't have power, no, no, no. Um, um, well, yeah, you guys don't remember these songs, do you? All right. Oh, yeah, you do. OK, fine. That's it. Um, but I want to offer, now quoting uh, Mick Jagger, some sympathy for the GOP. Uh, because in my view, this is, this is actually not the right way to think about the problem. The problem is that the GOP is a scornful of compromise. The problem is that the GOP um, is now in the middle of a, either a civil war or a nervous breakdown. And the problem for the GOP is that the GOP used to be the dominant political party in the United States. And it is no longer the dominant political party in the United States. Uh, and when you are, are in the middle of a civil war, or a nervous breakdown, or, or a 19th nervous breakdown, again to quote Mick Jagger, um, it's very hard to remain the dominant party in the country. Why are you no longer the dominant party in the country? Well, there are multiple reasons. Some of them have to do with demographics, a point raised in the last session, which I'll come back to a little bit later. Some of them have to do with the increasing factionalization in the party that's created by having achieved certain goals, and then there are other goals that you want to achieve. As you move to the next set of goals, then you get sig significant disagreements uh, within the party as to what are the goals and how you want to pursue them. Uh, and it's just the case that as you move in history, the situation you face is different, and it causes splinters that weren't there when, in fact, you formed the original coalition. So in any case, what you have is a, a dominant party that's basically losing its edge. And this is another way of trying to understand what's going on. What you see is a dominant party that was once dominant, which is sees that it's losing its political dominance. It sees that the other party is ascendant. And it is now attempting to do almost anything it can to prevent that from happening. It is throwing anything against the wall to see if it sticks. It is, as you know, kitchen sink metaphors would be appropriate here. And this is another way of trying to understand the two government shutdowns in recent American history, the one in 95, 96, and the one in uh, the, the uh, default, the debt limit crisis of 2011, which becomes the debt ceiling crisis plus shutdown of 2013. Uh, one way of understanding that was an attempt in the face of a de the first Democratic president elected since Reagan to attempt to try to run domestic policy out of Congress instead of running it out of the White House. That was one way of understanding what Gingrich was after. 
um, he would be sort of like the prime minister, and basically they would force uh, Clinton to do their bidding. Clinton at one point sheepishly remarked that the president is not irrelevant, but the very fact that he had to say that suggested that, in fact, Gingrich believed that he had the chance to change political conventions in a certain way. It turns out that given the American constitutional system, and here Sandy should be delighted, it's actually not possible to run domestic policy in the United States out of the two houses of Congress. It's not possible, in effect, to have the kind of prime minister that you would have in a parliamentary system and sort of jerry-rig it out of a presidential system. And so Gingrich was ultimately going to fail at this, and how he failed was interesting in its own respect. But the thing to understand is that the failure of the Gingrich Revolution was not the end of the dominance of the Republican Party. In fact, it was anything. It was a stimulus to try to get up the hill one more time and to find a way to reassert the values of the coalition. Well, of course, that happens with George W. Bush's election. But of course, Bush himself is in some ways not a true believer. He runs on a campaign of compassionate conservatism. He is in some ways an apostate. Even though he claims to be following Reagan, he in fact is trying to manage a lot of different problems created by the succession of Reagan, first Bush, and Clinton. And so he gets into lots of problems. I don't have to uh, respond them here. And by the time his presidency is over, the Republican Party is even worse shape, which then brings in Obama. And here, at this point, the Republican Party is even more weakened politically. And at this point, they attempt to try to do what they did in 1994, this time only using one House of Congress. That is, that's what the debt ceiling crisis of 2011 and the debt ceiling crisis of 2013 are about the attempt to find some leverage point through which you can control domestic policy. You no longer control the Senate. You only have the Senate filibuster plus a majority in the House to play with. And so the strategy was, at least of the, of the radicals, certainly other folks didn't think it would work, of the radicals was to try to leverage domestic policy by leveraging the debt ceiling plus the government shutdown. It also was doomed to failure for reasons having to do with the fact that we have a presidential system and not a parliamentary system. Once again, Sandy should be very happy with this. Uh, but he's shaking his head. No, I, I wish Ted Cruz had won. But in any case, that, that, that then led to, you see, the, the next version of the cracks showing within the Republican Party. And this, of course, brings me to Steve Skoranek. Because what I've been rehearsing over the last five minutes is a version of Skoranek's model of presidential leadership tied to party leadership. And I'm going to adopt further some of Steve's ideas, but I'm going to tweak them a little bit because my concern is not presidential leadership per se, but rather constitutional regimes. But Steve's model, which is extremely useful, and I, I, it's very insightful, and it's helped me a great deal in thinking about these things, has two big ideas. One is a cycle of presidential leadership styles within a political regime. You start with a ground-clearing, disruptive, what he calls a reconstructive president, and then you end with a president who basically can't hold his coalition together, a disjunctive president. And then his other idea, very important, extremely important understanding what's going on right now, is what he calls the waning of political time. That is, the fact that each attempt at ground clearing, at, at starting out in a new direction, at disrupting, um, is weaker and weaker each time, especially in the 20th century, so that FDR really can't uh, destroy. He can't engage in the creative destruction of someone like Andy Jackson. And Ronald Reagan can't even muster that much creative destruction. And so that idea is coupled with the idea of cycles in time. Right, and thus bringing us to the present moment, in which Steve suggests that, that even if one hoped that Barack Obama would have this kind of ground clearing, uh, disruptive, creative role, he really can't do it. Right. So again, to quote Disco, um, uh, Steve's vision of the reconstructive president is like uh, George Clinton's uh, vision in uh, Parliament Funkadelic, uh, tear the roof off the sucker and force the other party to give up the funk, you see. Um, and, and his point is that as you go through these cycles, it's increasingly more difficult to tear the roof off the sucker. Right? That's, that's a way of understanding it. So um, that would help us understand, in some sense, what's going on. We have a, a, a successful political regime from not beginning in roughly 1980. The regime goes through uh, Skaronic cycles. 
Uh, it leads to various forms of oppositional opposition by the Democratic Party, but still rather weak. Um, and the idea is that it chips away eventually, the old regime uh, breaks apart, it factionalizes, it radicalizes, and then eventually, finally, the next oppositional leader who comes along would eventually be able to displace it through a ground clearing act. Only the problem is the institutions have gotten so thickened and there are so many kludges, we might say, in the system that it's no longer possible to do that traditional ground clearing. And that is a way of understanding exactly where we are today. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, I should point out, this, I don't know if this is central to Steve's view, but it also strikes me that as you get, as, the, uh, as I said before, as a party becomes more factionalized, it also tends to become more radicalized. That is, there are, there are parts of the party that really says it's really time for us to get what we came here to get. And so they really push hard. If you can think about the Democratic Party, say, between 1968 and, say, 19. Uh, 80, you'll see elements of the Democratic Party really wanting to, to perfect the social democracy in ways that didn't seem possible. And 1968 is not seen as a repudiation of the possibility of perfecting this world, but rather as a stimulus to actually try to get over the hump and do it. Well, it doesn't turn out that way, in fact. Uh, and certainly Jimmy Carter is not the man to achieve it. All right, but if that's basically right, and I think that, that Steve has gotten most of this basically right, does that mean that we are not going to have a new transformation? And I think the answer is no, and this is where I'm going to slightly diverge from Steve's model. Because my interest is in not presidential leadership, which is Steve's primary concern, the cycles of presidential leadership and the limits of what presidents can do and the authority that presidents have given the circumstances in which they find himself. That is his project. My project is constitutional regimes. What are the basic commitments of a constitutional order? It's closer to what Mark is interested in. What are the basic agendas? What are the, uh, the commitments, to borrow a, a phrase from Steve, of ideology and interests that are characteristic at a certain time? What, what are we trying to do? And what are we trying to use the judiciary to do in shoring up the commitments of this particular regime? So if we think about, if we get rid of the transformative president in Steve's model, and instead we think about six other features of a regime, here's what we get, I'll tick them off. You get a transformation, you get a new dominant party, that might be the Democratic Party. You get new forms of party organization, that would be organizing for America, the use of the internet. Indeed, one, one view that I've had, because I'm a techie, is that the new party will no longer be organized around patronage as it was in the 19th century. The new party is a database. That is, the new party, what holds it together, are, uh, are database techniques that allow you to figure out, uh, plus surveillance, right? I actually, you know, uh, in fact, Nancy Rosenbach talked about this yesterday, in which you organize the party in terms of getting information about voters, likely voters, you create a database, you engage in surveillance, and that way you basically organize your party around the possibility of using information systems. This is what we see in our world today. This is the way in which parties will be organized. You can see that such a construction of a party is very, very different than the Jacksonian mass party. It just looks very different, and it works very different, and it creates all sorts of real problems. One of the problems is, who are you going to share the information with? Right? And so the control over the databases actually becomes extremely important in this world. So that's the second point. The third point is shifts in the demographics of the dominant party. Well, that's something that was touched upon in the last session and something that's quite important in understanding what's going on. The United States has been undergoing demographic shifts for some time. The, the Obama coalition appears to be what has been called a coalition of the ascendant, which is a coalition involving single persons, um, uh, racial minorities, uh, well-educated elites uh, and, uh, and women, although in fact it turns out the Republicans are still winning more women, uh, still certainly winning more white women. Um, but in any case, the coalition which is forming is a different coalition than the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition, and it is coming at the expense of the Reagan Coalition, which is basically falling apart. So that's the third feature of a new regime. A fourth feature would be uh, a reorientation of what party agendas are and what the purposes of governance are. That would certainly be, could be understood as what's going on today. And then finally, uh, changes uh, in, this is a, also a phrase from Steve, as I said before, of the commitments 
of the government? What are the ideological commitments of the government? What are the interests that the, uh, the dominant party seeks to serve? All that could be the, and then finally, for those of you who are con law uh, mavens, uh, changes in the composition of the judiciary and what the judiciary is enforcing. That is to say, one role of a, a federal judiciary in a regime is to enforce the regime's commitments. So you can think about the, during the Reagan administration, the Reagan regime, excuse me, uh, conservative judges and justices are enforcing federalism commitments, property commitments, uh, a particular conception of free speech, a particular conception of presidential power. Uh, if you have a new regime with uh, folks like uh, Sotomayor and Kagan in it, uh, it'll probably be uh, enforcing a different set of commitments, uh, right, in which we can talk about a little bit later. So all of that, you see, still remains, even if we get rid of the idea of a reconstructive, ground-clearing, Andy Jackson-style president. Even if we don't have the creative destruction of the reconstructive president, we could still have all these shifts. And so in that sense, uh, it's the, the, the cyclical part of Steve's model still might exist, even though the political time, the waning of political time model doesn't. But it, re it leads to a very interesting problem. And here's the problem. It actually is important in American democracy as opposed to, I suspect, in other uh, parliamentary systems, and I'd be very interested in what the comparatives have to say about that, that the president plays this uh, ground-clearing, destructive role. Um, and so imagine a world in which you no longer have that kind of actor in the system who no longer comes in and sweeps away the, the chessboard. That's going to mean that the transition is going to be very hard. And it's going to be very protracted, basically because you can't get rid of all the accumulated detritus of American politics. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to sort of snake around them, right? You're going to have to weave in and out. And this is also a point that Steve was making yesterday, which means, first of all, that the transition is not guaranteed to occur, number one. And two, if it does occur, it will occur in a deeply compromised form. One that basically puts the president in a different position than somebody like Jackson or Lincoln would have been. And that seems to be something like we're seeing today. Let me give you an example. Just take, let's just take Obamacare as an example. Obamacare is what uh, Steve Tellis calls a kludge. It's kludgeocracy. Instead of providing uh, you know, Medicare for all or a single payer system or something that would actually make some sense, Instead, what it is, is it's a kind of three-layer pie with expansion of Medicaid plus um, a Medicare kept where it was, plus some changes in Medicare, plus uh, the, the, uh, basically bringing in the insurance companies, private insurance companies, and adding a bunch of surpluses. It's just an enormous policy clutch. And the reason was because there were so many blocking points that that's basically what they get even when they had 60 votes in the Senate and a majority in the House, all right? And then, of course, what we discover is there's been a difficult, some difficulties, recent unpleasantness, we might say, with the rollout, right? And so the fate of this particular exercise of state building is as yet unclear. It could be the case that all of these kinks are worked out, and it turns out to be a much beloved feature of uh, American uh, politics, just as it is in Australia and England and other places. Or it could uh, turn out to be, instead of a BFD, uh, as Joe Biden would say, a BF disaster, you see? In that case, you see, what will happen is you'll get a resurgence of the old party. The, the, the Republican Party will reform and it will get a second wind, and it will keep the fight going for a long time, right? And that's, that's possible. It's certainly possible today. Um, it could happen. Or it could be that you'll just have this long slugging match, and eventually the Democrats uh, will win. What could happen? We don't really know the answer, but it's very much like watching a fight between two exhausted fighters, neither of which can land a knockout blow or watching a Red Sox game in which neither the Red Sox nor their opponents seem to be able to score the winning run and we're in the 18th inning. This is a way of understanding what American politics is like today and that's why you call it dysfunctional. But what it actually is, it's the birth pangs of something new. Well, let me um, suggest that Mark may be right that we may be moving into a new system that starts with polarized parties. 
and that the only way in which energy and initiative can actually be restored to government is if one of these polarized parties wins everything and then basically imposes its particular constitutional vision. And which one it will be, we don't know. My suspicion is that if that were to happen, the parties would not stay polarized very long. Because again, the cycle would renew and there would be differences within each party coalition and we would move away from polarized parties to something a little bit less polarized. But in the short run, that's what would happen. Well, who's most likely to win this struggle? Who's most likely to score a run in the bottom of the 18th inning, right? The most likely party right now, but not certain, would be the Democrats for the demographic reasons we discussed earlier. That is, the demographics are on their side. And unless they screw things up just terribly, they will eventually be able to prevail. But nothing is guaranteed. In other words, they have advantages, but they don't have certainty. The last things I want to talk about have to do with some of what I was calling the scarring or the side effects of a long protracted struggle between the parties in the creation of a new regime. And they have to do not with Congress, but with the executive on the one hand and the judiciary on the other. And that's where I, I'm going to end. On the executive side, well, what do you think happens when Congress is thoroughly unable to get anything done? and the president can't rely on Congress to do even the most minor fixes to the health care program, or even to fund the government, or even to make modest adjustments, right, in order to get you out of the problems created by the sequester. What happens is the president starts taking on more and more responsibility for solving every feature of governance to himself. The president starts interpreting statutes in ways that are rather controversial. The president starts using the administrative state to basically create waivers and exceptions. And he basically says, I'm going to do this all myself. I'm not going to ask Congress for anything. And so what happens is he starts to act that the way he acts in the foreign policy space, in which he has enormous room to run. Now, Sandy and I wrote an article together called Constitutional Dictatorship some years ago. And I remember we had this long discussion we both agree that, at least in the area of foreign policy, the president basically can do it most of the way himself. He can, you know, he's hemmed in in certain ways, but he has a lot of room for action. And one of the disagreements Sandy and I had was over the president's uh, dictatorial powers, we might say, in the domestic policy space. And we both agreed, after some haggling, that, in fact, whatever the president's policy powers are domestically, they're certainly much less than they are in the foreign policy space. But what's interesting is that if you create a completely stymied Congress, the temptation is for the president to start to act more and more like a person who's going to do everything. And what will suffer in the process is the rule of law. That's what will suffer in the process. And those precedents that are created during this period won't go away when you get a new regime. They'll be pocketed by the president, and he, the next president will use them again. So that's the first instance of what we call scarring that's produced by a long, protracted struggle. The second kind of interest has to do with the judiciary. Now, the way in which a constitutional regime changes involves a certain degree of staggering. That is to say, it doesn't change in the political branches at the same time that it changes in the judiciary. And the reason is because the judges have life tenure, and when they leave the court is just accidental. It has to do with lifespans, scandals, whatever it is. And so it's not like on you know, January 1st, 1980, suddenly you get a reorientation of the way the judiciary thinks about it. It takes some time, right? And similarly, if you think about it, the, uh, you know, the, the fact that LBJ miscalculates in 1968 with Warren's retirement changes the calculus in ways that nobody could have predicted. So what we have right now, it looks a little bit more like the problem that FDR faced or the problem that Reagan faces. He doesn't have a, um, uh, Obama doesn't have a friendly court. Instead, he has a court that is dominated by the old regime. And when you have that kind of situation, you get, um, uh, to quote Janis Joplin, the tendency to get it while you can. That is to say, at this point, because the party is radicalized, and uh, you get several things. First of all, the, the members of that party and their views are going to now want to use the courts while they still have control over the courts in order to get things done. It's like that scene from Godfather II where Michael Corleone says, today I take care of all unfinished family business. Right? And so that's a way of understanding Shelby County, 
Citizens United, and a whole host of other areas. You now have five strong conservatives. They really want to do some stuff. It, this is the time to do it. You're going to get what Gerald, uh, Gerard Mayoka calls preemptive judicial review. That is, you're going to try to uh, take on particular important issues that were crucial or important to the, the regime, the old regime, and you're going to try to resolve them. This is related to your work, too, right, as well. And that's a way of understanding what we're seeing. But it won't last forever. Um, what will, and, and therefore, we can also expect significant struggles between the presidency and the judiciary until such time as you get uh, the Democrats being able to appoint most members of the court. But in the meantime, hold on. It's going to be a bumpy ride, which leads me, of course, to my conclusion, which I will also express in terms of disco. Right? And, and here's my view. I compose this myself. The last days of disco have much to teach us about our constitutional system if we will only listen to them and dance to them. True, we are not yet in a boogie wonderland, but the possibility of a new regime is still staying alive. Sometimes it seems as if the old regime never can say goodbye. No, no, no. That we are in what Professor Diana Ross once described as a love hangover, or what Dr. Michael Jackson has called a real killer, diller, chiller, thriller tonight. Or perhaps, as scholars of the Australian constitutional system, the Bee Gees, have suggested, it must be the night fever. Some politicians, it is true, are uncooperative. Like the village people, they want to be a macho, macho man. Are you listening, Ted Cruz? Others, like Dr. Jackson himself, won't stop till they get enough. Nevertheless, as Hot Chocolate once brilliantly put it, I believe in miracles and that we will turn the beat around and get ourselves to Funky Town. That's the way. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I like it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And remember, I close with the words of the great political scientist, Gloria Gaynor, we will survive. Thank you very much. I understand you're going you're gonna to take some questions now? All right, very much. push you a little bit on the epistemological premise or disciplinary premise um, of your, so basically what you do here is political science, is not constitutional. That, that's, you're saying it's a bad thing. No, I'm saying it's a wonderful thing. Okay. So I want to ask you, I want to ask you, I mean, so some of the ideas you expressed, uh, you said yourself are from Skoranek and Graeber, and some of the ideas that you did not refer to directly are from, you know, this um, uh, insurance theory of judicial review and right. hegemonic preservation. And basically, your work, and your basically work constitutional well. politics more than constitutional law. Right. Can you isolate the Sandy Levinson point's contribution to this? And Tell us more about the core constitutional law aspect in the story that you tell that altogether make it a different story from a political science story per se. Oh, I thought you were going to say that make it different from a parliamentary system because that's the Sandy right, Levinson good. point. So you can take it in whatever Yeah, direction. so the Sandy Levinson point is that, uh, that it, because you have a particular system of separated powers, you have a presidential system. This is the way the struggles get worked out. Actually, it's not just Sandy, it's also Bruce Ackerman's view. Um, and that, and so, that, so that the way this is going to happen is just not going to happen the same way in a parliamentary system. What's interesting is that the Australian example is so close in some ways, right? Because you actually do have the possibility of this kind of protracted struggle. But you get to call new elections, which we don't get to do in the United States. But you wanted to know about the constitutional law part. Yes. What's the net Well, you know, I, I'm always borrowing from constitution, uh, political science to explain constitutional law. This is like saying, Jack, please talk about anything other than your work. Um, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I'm always trying to give an account of the processes of constitutional change. And so the way you understand those processes is to try to understand them against the background of what is uncovered in the constitutional law course. That is, how the structure of government uh, sets up incentives for people to struggle with each other, how the judiciary ends up, in fact, enforcing or playing against these particular commitments. This is the best way to understand the development of constitutional doctrine. This is what I do, you see. Now, so I think, I think we're at an agreement. Yes, OK. Very well. Yeah, yeah, first I have to object to what you said in the strongest possible 
technical term. Disco and funk, oh. Uh, disco and funk are distinct genres, the same way that rock and punk would be distinct. So uh, mer merging George Clinton in is, is, is inexcusable. Uh, but what I want to ask, <laughs> what I want to ask him is either the third or fourth of the sixth developments you came up with yeah. was the notion of election by database. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. No party, party as database. Party, party, party as party database, as, yeah. which translates into election by database. What the parties do is then identify their voters. You put the buses where the voters are, and you bus the voters to the polls. I think empirically, you're absolutely right. The question is what implication that has for the concept of democracy. See, for someone like me, democracy is two people coming on a third in an alley saying we just voted two to one to take your wallet, hand it over, multiplied by a hundred million. And if what you've described- 100 million people and 100 million wallets. Right, 100, yeah. Depends on the turnout, right? Yeah. Uh, turnout to the mugging. Um, if the development goes the way you, and, and I think it does, does that mean that democracy is going to start looking more like that model and a whole lot less like the civic engagement, let's discuss, that Larry and Robin West want to foist on me? Um, the answer is that the challenges for civic engagement are going to be different than they were in the past, and they're going to be ever more urgent. That is, it's really important that people imagine models of civic engagement when, in fact, what political parties now do is spy on you, you see, and collect data about you, and mobilize you to get out the vote. So you're going to have to take over these parties, right, or, they'll t or they will take you over. That's the way I would put it. Right, then. That's the way I would put it. Actually, my question follows directly on that point, and it's, it's a point that the point about parties is actually even much more complicated than you're articulating it. Because the first question is really, what is the party? Because there's, there are the people who own the databases, and most of those are private actors, right, who are third, who are contractors. Mm -hmm. There's the centralized party. There's, there's, there are the candidates. There's you know, organizing for action, right? So you have a series of different entities that are fighting for or trying to articulate a particular political vision as well as running the technocratic aspects. And so, so there's some interesting things there between, say, Obama's campaign and the Democratic Party. So who is the party is, is an important central question as well as what the thing that we're calling the party is doing is also another important question. And in terms of civic engagement, there's you know, you're right that the party's spying, but they're also doing something else. They're sending you messages that are, right, the Jack message is very different right. from the Gee message, right? right? Um, and so do we call that um, communication, and what does it do for accountability? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a much more complex question that even starts at the basis of what is it that we're going to call a party in the mid-21st century when you have tabulation, aggregation, different messages, different political organizations, right? And, and so um, I'm curious to, for your thoughts on where that, if you have any views on where that development really might be heading and what does it do for the theory that you're espousing? Well, I, I don't, I can't predict the future on this. I can just note the symptoms. One other symptom, which I'm sure you've thought about, is the rise of folks like um, uh, you know, Sheldon Adelson, who basically go off on their own and decide to finance campaigns with sufficient money, uh, which undermines the ability of the party to discipline itself. And it also, right? And uh, so what we see is the, the way in which people imagine parties would work, how would they discipline their members, all of the various ways that you kept parties coherent those things have all been disintermediated, we might say, to use the metaphor of the internet. And so you're going to have to find new possibilities for party discipline in order to make parties work in the 21st century. Ellen was asking me, what, you know, what should we write about in law school now? I think this is what we should write about. We should write about the legal underpinnings of parties and uh, you know, how can parties be regulated now or how can political action be regulated now depending upon the goods that we want uh, uh, parties to achieve. There'll be a lot of First Amendment challenges, by the way, to any such attempts at legislation. Great. I think um, I, a couple of comments and maybe a suggestions when you're as you're thinking about this, and then a question. Um, first of all, I think you know the the um, what I found interesting is 
when you talk about the different times that there have been these kind of transitions, that some are very painful and some of them are protracted and some are less painful and less protracted. And I thought, obviously, the Civil War would be on the, you know, on the side of the most Pretty painful. painful yeah. And the Reagan Revolution may have been less painful. Yeah. Now, the end of disco, you could think about like disco demolition night and what happened. They couldn't play the second game of the doubleheader because the field was so destroyed by blowing up the disco records in center field that day. But, but uh, how, where do you think the current uh, transition fits in terms of the, you know, how long and how painful it is compared to other trans, you know, the, the New Deal and the Reagan Revolution, obviously the Civil War, but, and also, I'm curious because you said you don't think uh, Citizens United is the very important, and I wonder maybe social media is about that. Maybe you could think about sort of Citizens United social media and the current transition, and maybe that would, you know, shape how, how you would think about the, the, you know, sort of the, the level of pain and, and duration of the current transition. So extrapolating from what you said, um, that would suggest that although this particular transition is not going to be very violent and cause a lot of death, like the Civil War, it just may be more gradual. So there'll be a lot of difficulty over a, relative, a longer period of time. Whereas one thing about the Civil War is the Civil War, it's, it's devastating. And a lot of the, the carnage occurs in a, a relatively short period of time, right? The, the New Deal transformation is somewhere in between. Uh, the answer is I, I don't have for you a general theory of how many people die <laughs> in a transition or how much property damage occurs. Each one seems to me different on its own, uh, have its own premises. My suspicion is that this one will be long and protracted, but Everything, but I've always been wrong, you see. Yeah. I've always been wrong. You, uh, the people here in this audience probably have at least a good an opinion about this as I do. What do you, anything about social media? That was sort of, I know that was, a, I had a lot of different things in the question, but anything about social media and the current transition, that's obviously, that's a different. But what in particular, Jack? Well, it, what kind of role is, so, do you think social media you It's know, already yeah. played an, an enormous role in, in the political campaigns of the present. I suspect it will continue to do so in the future. Uh, Mark Graver, then uh, Mike. This is it's sort of one of the statement with a question mark inspired by Rand's statement with a question mark. It goes like this. Might it be the case that what we call con law yeah. is a product of the New Deal order and the way it was structured? You mean so the study of constitutional law as law? Yeah, and said with judicial supremacy, focused primarily on an elite group of law professors who do not think of themselves as interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. which I think was true when we went yeah. to law school, that it's a distinctive project that if we looked at the way con law was studied before 1930, it is organized very differently. And the very difference in looking who's at this group, this group could not have existed. 30 years ago. So I'm wondering you know, whether we are likely to see transitions in the very organization of constitutional studies as part of the tra political transitions you're talking about. That's a very interesting idea. Um, it, I hope that people who study, who study constitutional and law schools will be doing more political science and more more comparative uh, constitutional law. These are all things, directions in which I'm moving, and so I hope other people do them as well. Um, I suspect, though, that the nature of the law school as a professional institution, that is, they produce legal professionals, right, will, however, always put a limit on the kinds of transformations that can occur. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. F first. Thanks for putting the funk into dysfunction. Yeah. Um, it, the question. So I, you were in those discos in those it, days too. You right? bet. I, yeah. I knew you could Look, get here's down. A, right. Here's my question. Um, don't you think that transition requires sort of some articulation of what you're transitioning to? Yeah. Some articulation of. Okay, if we had our way, this is what we would want, mm -hmm. right? And it just seems to me, I mean, what's striking Amer about American politics right now is that neither side seems to be particularly well prepared to sort of answer that question, certainly not in sort of putting over some, you know, 
coherent program of that sort. I mean, you know, neither side is maybe sort of well organized for it. And in, in that environment, how do you distinguish sort of a protracted transition to something completely undefined and unknown from just sheer entropy? It's just... This is a very good point. I, here I want to... Um, I listed a bunch of the features of regimes that um, remain even when you don't have a transformational president. There's one I left out. Uh, and this is also a feature of presidential leadership, so it's actually related to Steve's work. Uh, transformational presidents have an obligation, a duty, or an expectation that they will also outline in very gauzy detail uh, the direction in which the dominant party is going to take. If you wanted to see what that looked like, you could probably not do worse. You not to do better, rather. You could do worse than studying very carefully the rhetorical tropes in Obama's speeches, and in particular, the speech that kicks off his reelection campaign. Uh, he goes back to the place where uh, TR makes that spe famous speech, New National Speech, and he basically tries to do that again. I think if we study that speech very carefully, also his Nobel address on the foreign policy thing, we would actually start to see the glimmerings of what the, the transformation is transforming toward. Again, it's going to be in very gauzy terms at the very highest abstraction, but I think that's where we would find it. Uh, Mark touched it. And you have? I must confess to being a political scientist, and I, it seems that our role at this conference is to raise uh, niggling little facts. The first uh, niggling question uh, based on facts that I want to raise is, in what sense has the Republican Party been dominant? I mean, if you take the um, uh, period since the, let, let's just define the modern period as the post-Voting Rights Act political era. Yeah. By the time of the next presidential election, the Democrats and the Republicans will have held the White House for roughly the, the same period of time. The uh, Republicans uh, consistently were the smaller party in the electorate. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, they have been much more competitive than in the past, but I uh, really question whether as a political party they have been dominant. Now let me transition to something which might seem, uh, but I don't think is contradictory, to the degree that they have been a more successful party, what's wrong with having inherent contradictions? Uh, that uh, when the Democrats were closer to being a dominant party, they had massive contradictions. In fact, when I reflect on American political history, I'd say whenever, as, a, you know, as an iron law, whenever any political party has been really strong, it has had contradictory elements in it. In fact, I might even extend it further and say, I can tell you quite a few contradictory elements in the British Conservative Party and the British Labour Party over British political history. So um, I, I, I question whether uh, having factions is the uh, sign of disaster that, uh, th th that you suggested. Uh, I'm, I'm also, uh, however, just a little bit curious about whether, uh, given the current political discourse, there really is as much room for a, sh a, a decisive shift to the left, as you suggest. Um, it seems to me the, 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 the energy in the political system is more on the right, and the, and, and the trends in uh, fiscal policy have been to cut back on the programs uh, most favored by the left. Yeah. Well, these are all excellent questions. Uh, let me see if I can take them in the order which you asked them. What does it mean to say that um, the age of Reagan was a conservative era? Uh, right. Certainly, the, the Republicans didn't control the House and the Senate uh, for most of the period from 1980 on. They controlled it partly, but they didn't control it all the time. They certainly didn't control the presidency all the time. They controlled uh, it for many years. I would say that the way we would try to understand this would be um, which coalition of voters tended to have their interests uh, represented, their ideologies and their interests best represented. By, uh, by government. And I think that there's no doubt that it's the conservative interest in ideology that was better represented. This is Jacob Hacker's book uh, on uh, Off Center. 
um, one which he, and I'm sorry, it's, who's his, who's his co-author? Yeah, Pearson. Um, they, they, they do a wonderful job of basically showing you how all these policies are put in place. Uh, it clearly has to do with the way in the ju which the judiciary is structured um, and the way in which constitutional doctrine looks very different in 2013 than it did in 1980. Um, it also has to do, I think, with the ideas of ut political utopianism. That if you look at Hubert Humphrey's uh, acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention in 1968, and remember, Humphrey is the moderate in 68, it's unthinkable in terms of what he's asking for in terms of today. You would think that the man was a raving communist lunatic. Um, and that form of utopianism is snuffed out, basically, as a result of the, of the Reagan era. And another kind of utopianism displaces it. It's the utopianism you see in the work of the Tea Party, in sometimes in what Justice Thomas says, in, um, in what my dear friend Randy Barnett is trying to do. It's a conservative and often libertarian utopianism, which sees the possibility of actually being implemented, just in the same way that, uh, that liberals in 1968 imagined as within their grasp a particular kind of perfection of their political vision. And that's, the, what, that's related to your idea about factionalism. That is, what's interesting about our time is that conservatives, in, even in the middle of the Reagan administration, would have never dared to dream of certain kinds of constitutional achievements that now seem to be within the grasp of the Roberts Court. That suggests to me that there's something very interesting going on. I was saying this at dinner last night. Um, uh, it leads to, a, uh, a, to, to an interesting dispute within the legal professoriat over the value of judicial review. Whether or not you want judicial restraint or whether you want muscular judicial review. And right now what we see within the conservative movement is an important debate over judicial restraint versus very similar to the debate that occurred in the 50s and 60s within liberals. Uh, in which, so at the same time, this is meeting the, the Federal Society is having their National Lawyers Convention. I wish I could have been there. I was gonna talk about originalism, uh, but I couldn't make it because I wanted to come to this one. But there's, gonna, there's a debate, it may have already been happening, between Harvey Wilkinson and Randy Barnett over judicial review and over muscular versus traditional restraint, just review. And that was the same debate, I was talking to Frank Michaelman last night, that occurred when Frank was graduating from Harvard Law School around 1960. It was that same fight. Uh, and that was a really important fight. It's actually related to uh, your essay, right? The originalism that was and the originalism that will be. It's about that same sort of debate. What is, what is our constitutional vision and can we use the courts to achieve it? So your, your questions are really interesting and they lead us to all sorts of interesting ways of thinking about how we characterize a political era. Katie Young. So my, my question comes from the, uh, say, outside looking in to US constitutional regime change, because you didn't mention um, any role that America's own role in the world is playing in this change. So we're told that to be a superpower, a country has to have economic power and military power and cultural power, and if it lacks one of those three things, it's no longer a superpower. Right. So I'm wondering in your story what the changing role of America in the world is playing on America's own constitutional change. I. Um well, is the question whether we can imagine America remaining a superpower? given the protracted struggle over politics in America? The question is, if we assume we can't imagine that, right. what role is that going to happen in the constitutional change in America? Right. Um, I suspect that in the short run, the, what Sandy Levinson and I call the national surveillance state will continue apace. Um, what the long run looks like, I really can't say. It strikes me, though, that a situation in which the American government can't get itself together over a long period of time is inconsistent with an, uh, the United States uh, having an active role as a world leader. Well, this is terrific. We better break so we can have time to get back downstairs. It was wonderful to have. Thank you. Thank you.